So I'm going to give a talk about how the European Commission should go about improving the effectiveness of the EU emissions trading scheme. I put the word fix in inverted commas because it does beg the question, as was put, is it broke? Uh, in my view, no. Is there a broader problem that needs to be fixed? Yes. Is there a quick fix? Unfortunately not. And I'm going to elaborate on that for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, everything that I give here today is, is not my personal views. It reflects um, the, the, basically the consensus view of a climate change working group that reports into IBEX in Energy Policy Committee. We have a number of policy committees. And uh, the constituents of that committee would include large energy users and also a range of energy suppliers, including uh, in the electricity sector. But it doesn't purport to represent a unanimous view of all members. There will be people in this room who are IBEC members who may not agree with what's being said here. But we're a very broad church. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background to the current Commission proposal, which is backloading, to talk about what was happening earlier this year. Then I'm going to talk about the concerns and the views on the proposal itself. And then finally, a few comments on, well, if, if you don't like what's being proposed, what will you do instead? So we'll start off with the negative stuff and then hopefully finish on a more positive message. So if you go back to the first quarter of this year, uh, the or during the Danish presidency, there was quite a lot of discussion as to was the ETS in trouble? Could it survive even? That the very low level of prices was undermining the credibility uh, and indeed the, you know, the future viability of it. And there was a, a meeting, an informal council meeting in Denmark, uh, organised during the Danish presidency, at which a question was being put uh, as to what could be done to beef up the scheme and restore its credibility and ensure that it continued to be the backbone of policy. And that was in the context of a proposal to set aside, i.e. permanently remove a substantial quantity of allowances. Uh, frankly, you call that Plan B. So actually, that was Plan A. Uh, we're now talking about the Commission proposal being Plan B, so um, if we're going to do a permanent fix, it'll be Plan A. Um, and it, it is very difficult to see how that's going to get consensus because they sought it earlier in the year and they couldn't get it. So what's now being done is, if you like, what they are able to do within the current legal framework. But at the time, IBEC and a number of other stakeholders were asked on their views on the set-aside, i.e. permanent removal. And what we said at the time was, there is a problem, um, but what's being proposed needs to be looked at in a broader context. And that is, the, the emissions trading scheme is working as it was designed, but the, the, in the broader policy framework, in particular how it interacts, climate policy and energy policy, two different directorates, there are policy measures that are interacting in a way that wasn't foreseen and are actually tripping each other up. So what is needed is greater alignment rather than interference. There are risks in piecemeal tinkering with one part of the system unless you look at the whole of the system and you need a solution that's enduring rather than a quick fix for the next few years. And finally, not to forget that um, one of the benefits of a market-based instrument like the ETS is that it is designed to deliver a quantified amount of abatement at least cost. So fast forward uh, six, eight months to today, and we're now looking at um, a proposal which is now, it's, it's actually the legislation has been drafted, and uh, it's only one step away from becoming <coughs> a le legally enacted. So I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes through, but there have been a lot of debate in, in recent months as to whether or not it's going to have the intended effect. For the, for the uh, avoidance of doubt, um, IBEC, all of the IBEC members recognise that the emissions trading scheme is a key policy tool. It is by far the most important single policy that the European Union has come up with to address greenhouse gas mitigation. But we mustn't lose sight of the way it's supposed to work. Firstly, it's meant to reduce emissions in a cost-effective, a predictable manner. It's a quantity instrument. And g given that it's a quantity instrument, Prices are an outcome rather than an input. Secondly, it's meant to be economically efficient. Um, everybody has an incentive up to the same marginal abatement cost, and that's meant to avoid inefficiency. 
And thirdly, it's meant to provide a price signal that informs both operational decisions, such as which power plant should get dispatched in a half hour period, be it coal or gas, and also investment decisions, should I build a new gas plant, should I build a wind farm? Will I expect to see electricity prices above the support price that makes it attractive, even though it's not a particularly windy location? So there are a complex series of interacting hopes and fears. Now, of the two, I think the first two have been delivered. There is a big question mark over the third. But that's not the fault of the design of the scheme itself. Um, it was very interesting, uh, around about April, uh, Climate Strategies, uh, who Barbara and I have both worked with in the past, Michael Grubb um, published a paper that analysed to what extent is the current low price of EU allowances the result of the very deep recession. And his conclusion was, actually, the prices will be down on the floor anyway. That most of that effect is due to there's been some abatement within the ETS because of the carbon price, but there's also been a huge amount of abatement through the renewables directive and through the energy efficiency uh, directive that's impending and legislation to support energy efficiency. And I can provide a, a link uh, to that paper for anybody who's interested. The current proposal then uh, would allow um, or would formalise what the, the Commission believes is an already existing right to intervene whenever it sees fit uh, to change the timing of auctions to keep a price within what it deems to be an acceptable range. So it could be that prices are deemed to be too low or perhaps if there was a boom and prices started to soar and the economy was getting into trouble, they could intervene to stop it getting too high. Um, <clears throat> Our views on this are pretty much in line with those of Business Europe, which I'll just put up here. I'll just quickly read through it. So the key point is uh, IBEC is affiliated to Business Europe, so it's just one of 20-odd national organisations. So Business Europe would have similar but not identical use to, to Euroelectric, whereas Euroelectric is concerned about the proposal but on balance would probably uh, favour it. Business Europe has concerns about it and on favour would on balance would not favour it. Um, and the, the key points are coherence of policy and avoiding short term tinkering that could actually significantly increase uncertainty. Uncertainty is the enemy of investor confidence. If I could just unpack that very slightly, so this is something that um, I was trying to get my own head round what is the actual intended outcome and what is the likely outcome of the current proposal, which is merely to withhold allowances in the early years, but you have to put them back in the later years because it's not a permanent removal. So you take, whether you take out half a billion or a billion allowances, if you believe that it is a temporary removal, as Frank has said, you get a spike in the early years and then you get a slump, perhaps to zero, in the later years. It's only going to be a sustained increase if you believe that there will be further legislation that will permanently remove those allowances. Or perhaps that there will be a very, very stringent tightening in a post-2020 period that would soak up all of the banked allowances and, and cause the, the, the price, which is probably being partly propped up by banking at the moment, to be further banked. A third possibility uh, is that uh, people would see that it's going to be a temporary measure. They don't believe that that further legislation will come through because if they could have got it through the first time, they would have. What makes you think it would, would be more successful this time around? <coughs> and if then there were flexibility <coughs> mechanisms, whether linkages with other trading schemes, such as in Australia, or the use of whatever instruments, you could get around the short-term supply problem, borrowing the next year's allowances, that in fact the price might not even go up at all. So. Take your choice. Which of the three outcomes depends not so much on the fundamentals, but perceptions. The perception becomes the reality. I couldn't actually call it as to which of those three is the most likely. I know the one that's intended, and that's a, a, a sustained increase. So we would have concerns that you can't actually predict what the outcome is going to be, even though you know what you'd like it to be. So what are we recommending instead? Well, firstly, 
it is a long-term problem. It's a structural problem, and it's not going to be fixed overnight. You know, somebody who's building a plant that has a 30-year life wants to know that the price is going to be stable and the, the investment's going to be attractive for the life, not just for next year. If we're going to be able to link with other trading schemes around the world, and you know, the UN process currently is the only game in town, but increasingly we're moving towards if we can do a deal with a region such as China or uh, Pacific. If we can link our trading scheme with other trading schemes, that's going to help. But frankly, who'd want to link into something if they felt that politicians who won't be able to resist the temptation to interfere, uh, the, the term that was used within our climate change working group was this potentially is a tinkerer's charter and it could have unfortunate, unintended consequences. <coughs> the next thing is that there is and has been a certain degree of policy competition between DG Climate Action and uh, DG Energy. So you have targets being set uh, on energy efficiency, on renewables, and on climate, which supposedly were put together as a package. But experience has shown that's not actually how it <coughs> has turned out. In fact, there was a, a, a recent analysis that suggested if we got the 20% renewables and the 20% energy efficiency, we would more than achieve the 20%. There would be an overachievement. And then they turn around and say, oh, but maybe we won't get the 20% energy efficiency, so we need to bring in an energy efficiency directive. Uh, and that's nearly law now. And when that comes in, well, in fact, even as each stage has passed, you've been able to track the price of EU allowances going down. Part of the downward pressure on EU allowances has been the political progress on what has been a, a very, very stringent energy efficiency directive. And to comply with that directive, we will have to go substantially beyond what is actually a very good national energy efficiency action plan, uh, which was developed um, under Eamon Ryan, who I see in, in the fifth row there. So overall, I, I think, what is, is there a more efficient way of doing it? Is there a counterfactual where there would be, in a post-2020 regime, one target, a, a climate target, and it drove everything else. It drove energy efficiency obligations because energy efficiency is by far the cheapest way of mitigating climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And likewise, it could, it could drive the renewables program. We have a multiplicity of targets. And one way of then uh, looking at that, just to give a couple of examples, are the current level of prices a problem? Or are they the symptom of the broader problem that I've been talking about? Certainly, if there was a much higher price of EU allowances, it would make coal less competitive. Now, uh, Michael uh, Grothers and I were at a, a round table the other week, and uh, one of the speakers there, it's Chatham House, I won't say, well, actually not Chatham House, it was, it was John Mullins, said that there would have to be a 40 to 50% increase in the price of coal to change the merit order in the single electricity market here. Now, that's a very substantial amount, and it would imply to change the merit order, it's an all or nothing. You're either in merit or you're not. You would need an enormous increase in the carbon tax here. Um, but it could help, so that if the price of gas came down and the price of carbon went up, it would trip over at an earlier point. It could also, a higher carbon price, have an effect on emerging technologies such as carbon capture and storage, which probably would need a price in the range of 50 euros a tonne to be commercial. Although there's also technological development still to be done. But in Ireland, at least, the cost of EU allowances has only been a secondary driver in the development of wind. And I can recall the period towards the end of the uh, pilot phase in 2008 where the price of allowances wasn't at seven euros a ton, it was seven cents a ton. But the, the rollout of wind farms did not slow down. In fact, it sped up because it was being driven by a different directive. It was being driven by the, re the renewables directive and we're having feed-in tariffs. Now, the cheapest feed-in tariff is roughly 70 euros a megawatt hour for onshore wind. But there are other tariffs, for example, around about the 90 euro mark for uh, biomass. And I think biomass CHP is 130. 30, 120 euros. So you're talking about a premium of between 30 and 60 euros a megawatt hour. You're displacing a megawatt hour of combined cycle gas turbine, which has half a ton of CO2 in it. 
So you're actually talking about an implicit carbon price of between 60 and 120 euros a tonne. No wonder the price of carbon in the emissions trading scheme is being depressed. We are building very expensive carbon technologies, not because of climate policy, but because of energy policy. The policies are overlapping. You know, the, the ends are very, very worthy, but are the means economically efficient? And finally, I think I've already mentioned the Energy Efficiency Directive. Um, that is going to come in, there's no question about it, and it will drive much needed retrofit. Um, it's going to reduce the demand in the emissions trading sector, primarily in industry. Most of the rest of the economy is going to be in the non-ETS sector, but it has already had an effect on EU allowance prices. So finally, um, and the analogy I like to use is if you had a chair where each of the legs was constructed by a different directorate, the chances are it would wobble. And it's like the old cliche that you keep cutting a piece off each leg until it stops wobbling. You end up with just the seat and, and there's no legs left at all. So if my message is policy coherence, the legs need to work together. Thank you.